I think the rapporteurs can introduce the chair. So we can start at 3.30. Aditi. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Our chair for this session is Professor Anuradha Ghosh. Professor Anuradha Ghosh teaches at the Department of English at Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi. Her many publications include the following books, Filming Fiction, Tagore, Premchand and Ray, edited with Muhammad Asaduddin, published by Oxford University Press 2012, The Politics of Imperialism and Counter -Stra Strategies, edited with Pratish Chandra and Ravi Kumar, published by Akar Books 2004, Premchand on National Language, Rashtrabhasha, translated and edited with Saroj K. Mahananda and Trisha Lal Chandani, published by Akar Books 2019. Uh, thank you, Anuradha ma'am, for joining us. You may now take over. Uh, thank you, Aditi. Uh, very good afternoon to all present here. Uh, we are looking forward to the post-lunch session, which has three very diverse papers. And I'm very grateful to the organizers, particularly uh, Dr. Nishad Zaidi and Dr. Simi Malhotra for having me on board. And uh, the forays that this uh, conference has made uh, is pushing us to think beyond the definitive boundaries that we've been thinking through so far, particularly in literary and cultural studies. Having said that, I would like to welcome our first presenter, Caroline D'Souza uh, from uh, Srinivas Institute of Technology. Uh, she, is, uh, she is a conservative architect in the School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi. And her paper is titled The Cosmopolitan Nature of the Old Port of Mangaluru, Its Significance in Terms of Trade and Defense and Its Impact on the Heterogeneous Culture of the Area. So over to you, Caroline. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, ho I hope I'm audible. Yeah, perfectly all right. Um, I'd like to share my screen. Um, Is this visible to everyone? Yeah, it is. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, the thesis in 2018 where I came up, uh, where I was trying to come up with a conservation uh, strategy for the old port of Mangalore. And uh, this was part of the historical studies that I did. Uh, so I'd very quickly dive into the paper, a shortened version, of course. Um, so, the cosmopolitan nature of the old port of Mangalore, its significance in terms of trade, defense, and its impact on the heterogeneous culture of the area. The vitality and cross-cultural connections in the maritime enterprise of the Indian Ocean determined to, be, uh, determined to be an ecological landscape that connected contemporary cultures. The formation of important mercantile communities and the evolution of the commercial practices find detailed mention, especially in the context of the Indian, India's Western littoral which emerged as the premier maritime region and integrated large, res large regional economies of the West and South Asia. This paper aims at reiterating the cosmopolitan significance of the old port of Mangalore by expounding the geographical distinctiveness, transoceanic and intra-country movements, connections with the hinterland, trade and religion that make it the heter heterogeneous cultural milieu that it is. A little about what Mangalore is today. Mangalore the ad, or Mangaluru, the administrative headquarters of the Dakshin Kannada district in the Indian state of Karnataka is the large, is the Caroline, your internet is sloppy. Caroline, Cal geographically on the east, it is. Maybe Caroline, you can uh, switch Hello? off your video. You may switch off your video and just uh, speak right. to us through the audio because your internet was sloppy. Okay. All right. Um, is this better? Yeah. Uh, should I sh uh, share your screen? Share uh, your yes, screen. Please. Yes, please, Stephen. Second, um, second image. All right, I will continue. 
Manglo, like most other rapidly developing urban centers today, faces similar challenges, those of, those of population growth, leading to extensive urbanization and globalization due to increased trade, trade, therefore undergoing loss of its unique identity, both tangible and intangible, environment, and environmental changes due to exploitation of natural resources. It is a tier two city which falls under the gamut of the Smart Cities Commission, which was launched by the Indian Ministry of Urban Development in the year 2015. One of the key proposals of the Smart Cities Commission was the revitalization of the old port area, which was also referred to as which is also referred today as Bandar by the locals. On studying the proposal, which tries to infuse economic vigor and vitality into the area, one can perceive that implementation of the same will lead to gentrification of the area, leading to a loss of its genius loci or spirit of the place. It is therefore imperative that one understands the cosmopolitan cultural significance of the port or the significance that it, that it exuberates in order to make any efforts towards reinstating it to its former glory. Geographical distinctiveness in terms of the Konkan coast and how Manglo is situated in it. Along the west coast of India lies a disparate and compartmentalized strip of land which also comprises of the Konkan coast. The Konkan coast with its narrow and broken coastal land has short but much used rivers to carry all the regional trade to the Arabian Sea. The city of Manglo is circumvented by two rivers, the river Gurpura on the north and the river Netravati towards the south. These rivers, which originate from the Western Ghats, flow westwards to form an estuary by the creation of par parallel sand spits formed by literal waves running along their length, which abut the sea. The contour topography of the city helps in drainage towards these rivers, which then flow into the estuary and then the Arabian Sea. This drainage network protects the city from inundation during the monsoons. Hinterland connections with the old port. The historical geography of Manglo and other ports indicate a connection with the hinterland. It was the source for products of monetary value, which would be traded along the port. In addition to this, the passes that connected the port to the hinterland also connected the harbor to the seats of political power like the Vijayanagara kingdom through various times in history. The hinterland of Manglo city, previous slide, the hinterland of Manglo city would include Madikeri, Puttur, Bantwal, Beltangari, Vitala, Mudbidri, all connected via all co connected via rivers or western or the western ghat land passes like the agumbe sharadi or the sampajel alignments the seasonal variations that aided seafaring you can go to the next slide please the arabian sea branch of the southwest monsoon first hit the western ghats and first hit the western ghats in the konkan and malabar coasts are the first to receive rain this knowledge of the monsoon winds is what aided sea travel to and fro from the past for the, four, for the, for the past four millennia. Early seafarers clearly could not see the winds. However, they felt that there was a force that helped them in navigating the ship faster than the ordinary. It can be safely believed that without the help of the southwest monsoon winds, trade would not have flourished like it did in the past. Sealand in his article, Archaeology of Trade in the Western Indian Ocean, 300 BC to 700 AD, states larger distances, significant ecological differences between micro regions connected by the sea, scattered habitation along many coasts and the regularity of, and the, regularity of the monsoon system cause a lot of people to spend significant portion of their lives in locations far from the place they were born. They did not only include merchants and sailors like we believed in the past, but also artisans, guards, mercenaries, adventurers, rich and poor, free and slave. These people would have brought with them culinary habits technologies and ideas making the ocean and its coast an idea of cultural integration and diffusion. Transoceanic movements and intra-country migrations that led to cultural cross-cultural influences. <coughs> the ancient historians have made clear references to the city of Manglo situated around the old port. The Roman historian Pliny the Elder and the Greek historian Ptolemy make references to the city of Nitaras where they have stated that the area is not ideal for di disembarkation because of high piracy rates. Here, the city of Nitaras bears reference to the city along the river Netravati, which historians have now hist attributed to the city of Mangalore. This mentions to show trade relations that were present back then and piracy along this trade route could indicate the nature of flourishing trade. Pliny also states here, that the roadstead for shipping is a considerable distance from the shore and the cargoes have to be con conveyed in boats either for loading or discharging. This description of the geographical location seems apt owing to the sand spits at the mouth of the estuary. Archaeological studies have long been neglected 
along the all, along the coast of Dakshin Kannada, which is home to the old port of Mangalore. Although the presence of monsoon winds since the formation of the Indian Peninsula and evidence of paleo channels and mentions in ancient literary texts, one can assume that the port of Mangalore was of geographical and commercial significance. During the rule of the Kadamba dynasty, from the second century to sixth century, we have the Christian adventurer Cosmos Indo Indicoplastus, who mentions that Mangalore is one of the main marts for trade in pepper. The pre-Islamic Arabs would have made contacts with the old port of Mangalore in addition to other ports along the west coast. Their knowledge systems, their unchanged knowledge systems were used again to propagate Islam post the 7th century CE. As was tradition back then, safe docking onto land after days of treacherous travel in the Indian Ocean men one would have to give thanks to the Almighty. A physical manifestation of this new culture has been seen in the establishment of around 10 mosques from Kodangalur in Kerala in the south to Barkur in Karnataka in the north of the Konkan coast of India by Malik Udinar, who was a Persian scholar. One of, these, one of these mosques is present even today in the Bandar area of Mangalore called Zenath Baksh. <coughs> Excuse me. Back then, it would have been a plot of land marked out for namaz with a makeshift structure. However, today it has undergone multiple phases of building, repair, and extension. I think you can go to the next slide. This catered to a sizable population of Muslims residing in the area, which indicates the presence of a settlement or community of traders beginning to grow around the port. An invaluable source to understand the trading culture in the 12th century CE along the port of Mangalore are the Cairo Geniza documents. These documents are essentially letters between Jewish traders which were found in the Geniza or storeroom of the Ben Ezra synagogue in Futstadt, Egypt. They were collected over a period of almost a millennia. Many of these letters were written in Aramaic language which, which used the Hebrew script and used the name of Yahweh. The Jews believed that any document that uses God's language and the name of Yahweh could not be destroyed and was therefore stored in the Geniza long after its purpose was served. The letters pertaining to India have been translated and documented in a separate book. This book is of immense value to Manglo. It gives us an insight into the complex commercial relationships between ship owners, Nakudas, who are Nakudas, and businessmen across oceans conducting business from this port. The rising Islamic power in the 10th to 12th century CE, the Fatimid dynasty, encouraged Tunisian Jews to establish business enterprises at the port of Manglo. They document the most important products traded at this port were pepper and betel nut called fofal in Arabic, pugafala in Sanskrit, and popla in the local language of Konkani. Iron ore was brought from the hinterland, uh, hinterland via the Ghat passes. The raw iron ore was used to produce weaponry, which was an important defense commodity at the time. Besides ship owners, two most prominent Jewish merchants were Abraham Ben Yiju, a Tunisian Jew who spent nearly two decades at Al Manjarur or Manglo, and Mad Madmun Bihasan, who was the pre premier, who was a premier Jewish India trader at Aden. Many ship owners figure in the correspondence of, of and between these two Jewish merchants. Other than commercial aspects, one can also learn a little about the personal life of Abraham Ben Yeju. He is said to have married a slave girl he freed from the local Tuluwa community, but brought up his children to be practicing Jews, which essentially indicates the presence of a synagogue to carry out special customs, rites, and celebration of the Sabbath. Today, however, no, ex no evidence exists of the said structure because probably back in the 12th century, it would have been very ephemeral in nature. Next slide, please. The 14th century traveler, Ibn Battuta, as was expounded by Professor Alam yesterday, speaks of visiting the city of Manglo, which he also called Manjarur. The mentions that Manjarur is situated by an estuary, it could possibly stipulate an advancement in navigation technology that would help travelers and traders disembark at the site of the old port instead at the sand spits that were by the estuary. He also gives us valuable information of the presence of a large populace of Islamic traders at the port who are originally from Fars or Persia and Yemen. This may perhaps indicate to us that the port of Manglo benefited both from both sea routes, the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea route. Batuta tells us that the main commodity that was traded here was ginger and pepper. He also tells us about the fights that would commonly ensue between the Muslim traders and the local Hindus that were, which required intervention from the king from time to time. He also mentions of a prom prominent Mohammedan who was teaching science, which Morris thought could be astrology. The domestic architectural manifestation would be probably architect vernacular to the region. 
in the 15th century, when this region was taken over by the Vijayanagara Empire, the port of Mangdo was used to import horses for warfare. The export surplus, goods like rice, for export surplus, goods like, and goods like rice and jaggery. <coughs> War horses would be bought in from Persia on larger ships, which not, would not be able to enter the estuary. Therefore, these ships would dock at the sand spit by the Arabian Sea, and the horses would be brought to the port via smaller vessels, a few at a time. This indicates that the port would now be dotted with stables and warehouses for safekeeping of horses and goods that have been imported or are waiting to be exported. Warehouses are an important typology, that built typology that exists even today in the area. <coughs> Next slide, please. This is the physical manifestation of the first mosque that was um, erected along the old port, the Zenat Baksh by Maliko Dinar. Um, next slide, you can go to the Portuguese map. <coughs> yes, this one. The Portuguese 16th century map of the port of Manglo is one of the first documents to record the urban fabric of the area. The Portuguese set up a fort along the mound at the mouth of the estuary. The fort was ephemeral in nature, which housed homes for Portuguese military men and a chapel to cater to the needs. The Portuguese let go an inquisition in the 16th century CE led to the migration of a large number of Gautsaraswat Brahmins and Christian converts from the community who were forbidden to follow cultural practices of the region. This was spoken about in Professor Ananya's paper as well yesterday on the first day. This mass exodus led to community settling along the coast of South Goa, on the coast south of Goa on the Konkan Belt, stretching from Karwar to Mangalore in Karnataka and the northern parts of Kerala. The migrations led to the uprooting of kul devtas or family deities from family temples that were destroyed during the Inquisition. Here we see two new communities added to the cultural landscape of the port of Manglo. Both communities assimilated into the local culture and added to the urban fabric settlement patterns adjacent to the port settlement. The Gautsaraswat Brahmins settled to the east of the port and the Catholic community settled towards the south. The Gautsaraswat community took on board trading activities along the port along the port with their Muslim counterparts. They set up temples to house their kul devtas, which were uprooted from their inception areas in Goa. With them, they brought a new cultural art form called Kavi Kale, which is, which is um, an incised plaster work done with red oxide. These temples were more Brahmanical in nature, which was very different from the local Dravidian, Tuluva, Daiva shrines or Nagabanas of the local populace. The domestic architectural manifestation followed the planning principles of the Hindu counterparts with the courtyard in the center. Next image, please. This wave also brought the first wave of Christianity to the city of Manglo. With them came practices of building churches, establishment of parishes and Catholic homes, which had porticos facing the exterior. Catholic families also took up large tracts of land beyond the area of the port for cultivation of rice, betel nut, coconut, and pepper. This building that we see here is the 1910 manifestation of the, of the cathedral that was actually um, erected by the Portuguese around five centuries ago. And above we see the Portuguese insignia and a tombstone. The migration brought a new language of communication. Next slide, please. The mi migration brought a new language of communication to the area. Konkani, in addition to the already spoken languages, Konkani in two dialects, actually, the GSB dialect as well as the Christian dialect in addition to the already spoken languages of Tulu, Arabic, and Beri. Although both community had the same roots, the culture of each evolved into their own distinct style. Next image, please. Another invaluable document to assess the urban culture of the port of Manglo is the 18th century hand-drawn map by French cartographer Lafitte de Brazion. This map demonstrates the plan of the city and the harbor as it stood in 1778. There is a sizable presence of a fort and a palace at the entrance of the estuary with fort walls, bastions, and watchtowers surrounding large plots of agricultural land around the port. The French map details out different types of agricultural patches indicating the presence of rice fields and tree orchards, which would have most probably been coconut groves owing to the landscape of the region. Another interesting fe feature, next slide please, is the 18th in the 18th century map is the indication of Tipu Sultan's shipbuilding yard. It was Tipu Sultan's father, a Haider Ali, who took a liking to this part of the kingdom and developed it actively, installing new industries, especially military ones, in and around the cities, modifying its, modernizing its fortifications and renovating the port where he set up a military dockyard. 
Tipu Sultan also developed trade during his reign over Manglo with and his kingdom uh, with Egypt, the Arabic shores, and the Persian Gulf. Shipbuilding, which is an important craft technique for all those local landscapes, still dots the setting of the port even today. Hi, Caroline. Uh, Caroline sorry, you have two start, minutes. But, yeah, you have very little time left, so kindly wind up. All right, okay. Um, after this, we see the coming of the Basel mission and the British, but I would like to read out my conclusion here. Um, the 21st century and the opening up of the Indian economy brought with it rapid urbanization and a mass migration of people from rural areas to the city. The cities were not equipped to accommodate such a large influx of people. This led to rapid urbanization beyond the old trading centers. Can we move to the next slide? In the case of Manglo, the city literally grew by turning its back to the riverfront. Second last slide, please. Here, the presence of the Tulu-speaking communities, the people of Arab descent, Gaud Saraswat Brahmins, and the Catholic community from Goa, Gujaratis from the trading town of Surat, the Protestant communities, and the migrant labor, labor communities in the past and present manifest in this hybrid of culture, architecture, or Indian Ocean architecture, in fact, like Professor Menon told us yesterday, religious and social structure forming a complex web of communities interdependent on each other for social and business needs. Last slide, please. Next, this stands witness to the cosmopolitan nature of the port in the past, the integrity of which still stands good today. Last slide, please. I would like to end with this image of um, this image of this painting by this national award-winning um, artist from Mangalore, Mr. Andrade, who has uh, given us a rendition of his port, which is very aptly named Bustling Bandar. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for that wonderful paper. Yeah, thank uh, you, Caroline, for this, uh, uh, you know, diverse um, uh, kind of discourses which are layered, which uh, one could uh, gauge from the different kinds of visual slides that you had uh, spanning across time. And uh, now uh, the paper, uh, which kind of reflected the heterogeneity of the culture of Mangaluru. Now, the paper is open to questions and comments, please. All right. While we are waiting for some questions to arrive on the chat box, uh, this is just a personal curiosity. If you have mm -hmm. time, if you would like to answer, uh, you are a conservation architect, if I'm correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How yes. does your, I'm just curious. How does your work relate to uh, the port cities like Mangalore in our current times? So, um, especially with the state, with the city like Mangalore, which falls under the Smart City Commission, and because I belong to the city, I'm very, um, it's, it's a very touchy topic for me personally. Um, a lot of gentrification is taking place in the name of um, urbanization, and what we see, the manifestation of port cities that we see all over India today, is because of millennia of cross cultural exchange via the Indian Ocean, um, and I think it's important to retain that integrity and authenticity of the place for the future generations uh, and for them to also be able to witness it. And um, if, if one sees the kind of proposals that, uh, you know, uh, offices in far off lands are designing for our cities, um, it just doesn't make sense. There's, uh, to, uh, first of all, natural resources are not uh, respected. I think uh, communities of place are not respected. The genius loci is, will be lost. And um, something like uh, green gentrification and displacement of, uh, you know, demographic is going to take place if they're just going to literally go and build up on what. Uh, uh, these pro Karen, what proposals have come? Because your voice is patchy. All right. Okay. Yeah. So what what I was saying is, I think we should be able to save our port cities because they've come up out of centuries of cultural milieu. And these are urban fabrics that show us and give us, um, show us, uh, um, which have now manifestations because of those centuries of contact, you know? And it is something that we should say for future generations to also witness and not just gentrify and displace communities. So um, I think, and um, as a conservation architect, I think it's important to understand these histories um, Otherwise, you cannot really put put an argument forth in front of the authorities, especially. 
Right. Thank you so much, Caroline. We have another question for you from Isan. He's writing wonderful paper following your emphasis on rivers which watered the culture of Indian Ocean. How you look at Professor Sugato Bose's emphasis on river basins in this and Ganges in nurturing the oceanic histories. Would you respond to that? Um, I am not aware of Professor Sugata Bose's emphasis on um, the river basins of Indus and Ganges. Um, I, my area of research is fairly new and uh, it came about because of, um, because of trying to bring about this cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan uh, sorry, this conservation strategy for the old port because of which I had to do these studies. So my study has been very limited, but um, I think I think this conference has opened up um, so many different perspectives in terms of geographies and cultures for me to look at. Uh, so I think this is another one which maybe I could um, take a look at. Isan. All right. Uh, we have a question from Professor Dilip Menon. He's writing, Caroline, a very descriptive paper. What would you say is distinctive about the port cosmopolitanism of Mangalore, if anything? How would you relate this to the history and changes in cosmopolitanism given the rise of Hindu right in the region? What are the themes that you would like to focus on architectural styles, perhaps like Iqtidar Alam's paper yesterday? What would be the philosophy and logic of conservation here? Um, there definitely has been um, changes in, um, I don't I, I, I'll just be very honest here. There definitely has been changes in the idea of cosmopolitanism um, given the rise of the Hindu right wing. And I think Manglo is, uh, Manglo's name pops up the world over when it uh, comes to leaders as such, which is very unfortunate because we have such a strong history and um, such a, uh, so many millennia of contact with the outside world that today we are now being known for this. Um, yeah. So it's um, very difficult, especially for professionals like us, to put forth this idea. And yes, this paper came about with, um, um, I mean, with because of looking at architectural styles. So yes, I think I would like to focus on architectural styles in the region. And um, what would be the philosophy and logic of conservation here? I think again. You know, the Brundtland report where one should um, save your resources for the future generations as well and not look at everything in terms of um, a money making machine um, like the waterfront, like even save the tangible fabric and respect the communities that have kept it intact for us so far. I mean, they could, when the new harbor was made, they could have all very easily just left and go the ones who actually saved and uh, saved the area and kept, I mean, made it the thing that it is today. All right. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, for now, these are the questions and the comments that we have received. Uh, we still have some more time for discussion. So maybe Anuradha ma'am can join in if she likes to make any comment. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm just uh, wondering about uh, the heterogeneous diversity. I mean, how does one, uh, you know, kind of protect the heterogeneous diversity of the culture of Mangaluru when the homogenizing tendency of the Hindu right is very apparent? What are your takes on this, Caroline? That's a, a very difficult question, ma'am, especially in 2020, um, and. Um, also with all the saffron that is uh, going around in the area. Um, I have to be very honest to say, I don't know. And it scares me uh, to no end, actually. So I really don't know, ma'am. I think that's a, that's a tough one. Okay, thank you, Caroline. I mean, uh, we have still three more minutes for more questions, if there are any. Uh, Ma'am, I think we can move on to the next session and let them keep coming here. Okay, okay. So I take the advice of Aditi.
And we move on to the next paper, which is by Sanjay Dansalia. He is a guest faculty in CS CRC Jamia Millia Islamia and a PhD scholar. So his paper is titled Lyrics as Travelogue Beyond Boundaries, an Anthology of Punjab's Mystical Wanderings. So over to you, Sanjay. For giving me this opportunity. Oh. Okay. So, uh, as I am in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, internet speed is limited here. So, I will switch off the video and uh, I will be on the audio only. Yeah, my topic is Lyrics as Travelogue Beyond Boundaries an anthology of Punjab's mystical wanderings. Language and religion share a symbiotic relationship with each other. Linguistic capabilities have adapted themselves to the evolutionary reality of the changing times. The antiquity of religion and their languages presupposes the linguistic remoteness and their subsequent eruption into many vernaculars. Over time, languages acquired regional dialects such as, just as religion acquired regional hues. Studying both the processes present a sort of dichotomy between the elite from the popular, universal from the local, great from the little, and institutional from the diffused. Punjab stood at the crossroads of this interpenetrative, popular, diverse, collaborative expression of the mystical dimensions. Here, the varied vernacular lyrical expressions were based on multiple imageries drawn from the universal deep structures that Noam Chomsky refers to. Regarding Punjab, Harjot Obrai observes the existence of region-wide multifaceted cultural system. He further elaborates, it was a world in which members of different religious communities and people of diverse social backgrounds easily collaborated in order to face the uncertainties and afflictions of human life. Their medium being the framework of popular religion. Punjab saw the crystallization of various mystical expressions. Mystical ideas and practices of Nirgun Sampraday, Sahajani Buddhism, Mahayan and Vajrayan Buddhist, Tantric Yoga, Hatha Yoga, Nath Panthi, Kanphata Yogis, or Vaishnavites and Tasavvuf found expression in the various dialects across regional boundaries. The lack of domain concern was based on the imagery of inclusivity of a shared universe, which expressed global interconnections. Guru Nanak chose esoteric terminology from a variety of traditions current during his time. The symbolism of this collectivism was Bhagat Bani. This internalized the religious journey through a universalistic imagery expressed in lyrical form. Andre Wink has described medieval Islamic India as a world on the move. This world of overland connections that tied India to the cities and states of Central Asia and Iran survived until the economic and geographical shifts that accompanied the onset of colonial rule. According to Nile Green, urban spaces were in turn connected by long but effective cultural routes that tied the peoples and places of Muslim India into patterns of long-term interactions, imaginary as well as actual, with a memory space composed of texts as much as territories. Regarding Islam, as such, Siddiqui observed that the particularity of Islam's spread narrates a million stories. Islam as a religion 
offers social mobility its stark simplicity and cosmopolitanism provided space to cultural localism which in turn extended the boundaries of cultural interchange punjab in its geographical and ecological affinity shared multiple commonalities both historical and sociological with sindh makran and multan these regions experienced not only a demographical influx but also offered shelter to multiple deviant groups which were facing peripheralization the process this process was on a global scale which provided blurred boundaries of cultural interchange in addition the presence of heterodox ideological sects and numerous deviant groups like khwarij zanadik malahids ismailis fatimids took shelter in these towns these heterodoxies and their esotericism found a pervasive foreground in the frontier zone of punjab sindh makran and multan punjab and its frontier past with sindh and multan emerged as the geo cultural ground carrying this imprint of cultural dialogue based on fluidity of identity and practices punjab absorbed pluralistic interpenetrative indic spiritualistic traditions guru nanak's emphasis is on intuitionism and arjan dev's compilation of adi granth including gurbani and bhagat bani reflected this pluralism this perception of collectivism engaged with diverse mystical utterings like those of baba farid jaydev namdev trilochan parmanand raja pipa sant kabir ravi das sur das etc the uniqueness of this mystical anthology was their orality and devotional populism these diverse traditions coalesced into the sikh community this participative orality redefine the dynamic of plurality subsequently mia mir's presence at harmandir sahib indigenized regionalized and universalized the diverse mystical popular tradition the popular sikh devotion to peer sakhi sarovar goddess devi kali mata shitla devi bhavani bhumi shrines and village deity ancestors pointed towards the wider sacred universe in the popular imagery peer sakhi sarovar had bhairavi lord shiva's manifestation as his messenger in shrine of nagaha near dera ghazi khan besides having four tombs like those of sahabas of prophet muhammad also has two sacred sites associated with hazrat ali punjab specifically expressed these aesthetic forms of interaction through varied mystical lyrical genres as punjabi language evolved these multiple mystical expression borrowed from a variety of literary conventions including persian qissa or anecdotes from malfuzat tazkiraz chands shabads dohe or shlok a variety of oral traditions existed expounded by preachers like sid and nath panthi ideas who belong to lower orders of the society the oral tradition of sid and yogis carried fantastic imagery of flying through the air over long distances and was widely accepted by the masses similar imagery was put forward by the sufi saint which gained popular credence the sufi emphasis on the monotheism and the significance of the peer and the mystical union with the beloved coincided with many aspects of these multifarious mystical traditions on indian soil the existence of this wide global mosaic offers the foreground for an interpenetrative experiential domain where a variety of mystical traditions found connectivity especially dispersed community experience informal ties of a shared culture language or kinship integration of small communities into great total community based on a shared mystical ideology 
define this global interdependence. Assertions of these blurred boundaries were constructed in defiance to peripheralization and emerging elitism based on religious identities. This was a global phenomenon which connected regionalities and their diversities into a syncretic mystical bondage. Expressions of these deviant assertions traveled throughout the various geocultural zones. Lyrics mirror these traveling expressions of dissent and diverse assertions in various languages and dialects. Esotericism became the language of heterodoxies which adapted the vernacular and local dialects to express defiance. This collectivism borrowed various genres of literary expression. Traditions of Kisagui connected regionality through narratology, sharing concept of piety, ishq, mahaba, peer, murid, kibla, mullah, pandit, tasbi, textuality, identity, and inequality amongst others. The geopolitical location of Punjab provided special proximity to these heterodoxies. The lyrical tradition of Punjab carries the imprint of sociological and circumstantial factors through readaption and reinterpretation. In contemplating the construction of the self, diversity found uniformity through mystical expressions. Influences such as Neoplatonism, Buddhist and Christian monastic traditions, Vedantic philosophy, yogic philosophy, shaped this mystical tradition. This dynamism realigned various subcultures and subzones and stamped with the new regionality. The complex process engaged with regional substratum cultures, which got represented in the lyrical and intellectual history of the region. Punjab's lyrical tradition carries this imprint of cultural dialogues, which points towards reinvention of collective identities beyond boundaries. Punjab's mystical lyrics used interreligious imagery of pilgrimage to escape textual rigidity in an effort to establish blurred boundaries. And I quote some lyrics here. Haji lok makke nu jande asan jana takht hazare. Jis wal yaar us wal kaaba asan pol kitaban jare. And the translation is, Haji proceeds towards the Makkah. However, I proceed to Takhat Hazara. I have researched all texts. And what I found is the Kaaba is positioned where my beloved stays. The emphasis on the Mushad shifted the focus from hierarchical silsila order to personalized peer akin to the concept of Guru on Indian side, thereby sharing the mystical space through indigenization. Translated lyrics are, the place of the spiritual guide is equivalent to the Kaaba, where pilgrimage is imperative. Keeping the patience of a lover, seek the shelter in the guide's dwelling. Another lyrics are, Mala lakkar thakur pathar tirat hai sab pani, Ram Margay, Krishan Margay, Charo Ved Kahani. Rosary is wood, idol is the stone, pilgrimage sites, or all water. Ram and Krishan both died. All four stories are, are four uh, Vedas or just stories. Punjab's mystical lyrics bordered on blasphemy in an effort to redefine blurred collective identities. This alludes to the presence of transcontinental identities within a common mystical framework, the kaleidoscopic socio-religious mosaic of Punjab caused the prioritization of establishing the platform of collective identities through persistent pluralism. A counter narrative based on the construction of the concept of Ashik is another rendition of the defiance. Similarly, the rendition of the concept of Ishq 
as a counter narrative to strict compliance of Sharia in Kissa, John Ray gets interwoven within the lyrics of the Kavali performance. A deliberate variety of sacred imagery from various religions was adopted to create a supra identity based on humanhood rather than sacred piety. The lyrics are Ganga gaya gal mukdi nahi paame so so gote khaiye Makka gaya gal mukdi nahi paame so so juma padaiye Bulla Shah gal ta mukdi jad mainu dilon pulaiye Translation is Pilgrimage to Ganga will not save you even if you take hundred of dips there. Going to Makkah similarly does not save you even if you offer hundreds of Friday prayers. O Bulla Shah, you achieve the final goal only by self-abnegation. Another universalistic concept which portrays this supra-identity of the self was deconstruction of extreme intellectualism through the concept of ilm and the text. The concept of ilm was posited against the concept of Gnostic knowledge. Similarly, the obsession with ritualism was counterposed with the concept of intuitionism. This is a powerful imagery for establishing a populist counter narrative of piety beyond identities. This was also a non elitist statement targeting structural elitism. The cohesion that these ideas provide cut across all identities. These ideas provide a counter narrative of cohesion through descent based on rejection, which is well expressed in Kavali lyrics. Hello. Uh, you have five more minutes. Did the voice stop for everybody or is yeah. it? Yeah. No, the voice has stopped for everybody, I guess. I think there is some connectivity issue at Sanjay's end. I'm, so, I'm sorry. The connection was lost. Yeah, yeah. I would understand that. You have five more minutes to wrap up your argument. Yeah. Uh, I'll just say it in now. So the, uh, here the oral lyrical tradition and cultural space acted as mirrors to these commonalities. Punjab placed at the crossroad of centuries of uh, demographic movement across continents and its geocultural mosaic provided the foreground for the incorporation of transcontinental heaven of ideologies, cultures, and religious discourses over a period of centuries. Cultural dialogues on the multiple planes sociocultural, religious, and so forth was a complex phenomenon. Linguistic and literary tradition of Punjab reflected the various hues of this cultural dialogue. Mystical wanderings evident in the lyrical traditions of Punjab exposed a wide canvas of genres borrowed from Arab Persian traditions and Indic traditions like Nirguna, Buddhist, uh, Sahajiya, Vaishnavism, and etc. Similarly, the peripheral and frontier zone regionality of Punjab attracted heterodoxies from around the globe, including these Khwarij, Zanadik, Malahis, etc. Esoterism became the language of heterodoxies, which adapted the vernacular and local dialects to express defiance. Vernacularization of mystical discourse in Punjab engaged its multilingual literary and linguistic traditions. The dialoguing narration of lyrics engaged with the regional milieu, giving expression to multiplicity, collectivism, dissent, etc., through lyrical retellings featuring Baba Farid, Bulla Shah, Sultan Bahu, Shah Hussain amongst others. A defined populism expressed a beyond boundaries collectivism, which found individual and local concerns far more relevant than a universalistic cosmological concept of piety. This was 
a conscious effort towards a deliberate distance creation from universalistic piety and in the process create space for a new collectivism which defied boundaries and identities is that the end of the paper Sanjay, have we lost you again? Yes. Um, I think should should we uh, like start the next session or maybe when he joins back, then he's back. No, no, that uh, yeah, we have to wait for him and we'll have have a few him. questions and comments for him. I yeah. Think. Yeah, we can discuss the paper if it is all right with the organizers. We can discuss the paper and uh, uh, then uh, move on. If there are any closing remarks that Sanjay, wishes. hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, Sanjay, could you make your concluding remarks, please? Ma'am, I'm done with it. You're done with it. That's very good. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, and uh, the paper is now open to questions. Right, uh, right. Uh, we have... uh, you know, you do mention vernacularization of mystical discourses in Punjab and you see it as a core resistance. But I was just wondering that because you are opening up to a diversity of different dissenting questions and even, you know, certain kinds of materialistic and proto-materialistic cults uh, where you're talking of Sahaja cult, you're talking of a, a kind of uh, Vaishnavite influence. So these... Yes, Cults have to do with different kinds of, uh, you know, the agrarian communal practices. So, yes, for looking at a wide historical or a wide trajectory of history, uh, when you are trying to look into how lyric as uh, uh, functions as travelogue um, beyond boundaries. So, uh, and and then you also construct this idea of new collectivism. So could you please elaborate on what is that new collectivism and what is the shared space, a kind of a universalized euphoria that you seem to uh, find uh, behind the texture of these songs and the way they travel? That is one part of my comment. And the second is I was also wondering how does it connect to the theme of this conference that is oceanic on oceanic thought? Please, and I, over to you, Aditi. Right, Sanjay, uh, you want to answer Radha ma'am's question? Aditi, Sanjay is not in the room. Okay, th I think we've lost him. Yes. Steven suggested, shall we now move on to the next speaker? Because I think we are losing him again and again. And that might end up wasting time if we don't have him to answer the questions. Maybe we can try later towards the end of the session if we find him. To answer because there are a lot many comments and questions in the chat box and we can take it together ma'am is it okay in the end yeah i think um, professor menon is uh, nodding in agreement so i take the <laughs> cue from him <laughs> professor saidi so we go over to the third paper of this session that is ehsanul ehtisam from jnu he has done his ma from the center for historical studies and uh, Ehsan's paper, I mean, uh, you know, there is a little glitch. He will clarify what the title of the paper is because there is something, a title in the, you know, book of abstracts and in the title in the synopsis. But probably it is in the book of, you know, synopsis that it works. The Sira Magazi literature, Padapattus and texts and sa sounds across the Indian Ocean Arabic cosmopolis. That is one title, and the other title that was printed elsewhere is Census Translated Padapattus in the Indian Ocean Circulation of Texts and Sounds Across Arabic, Persian, and Sanskrit Cosmopolis. So, ma'am, actually, he had uh, requested for the change, that's why. All right, all right. So, whichever one, I mean, is the latest. So, anyway, he can clarify. So, over to you, Isan. Hello, uh, am I audible and visible? Yes. Okay. 
now i'm going to share the screen and first of all i would like to um, thank uh, university of witwatersrand and jamia millia islamia for giving me opportunity to present this my primary research findings for my dissertation and and giving opportunity to present right away after the um, my research findings so i'm going to share my screen so is it visible yes okay so the title is census translator padappattus in the indian ocean circulation of texts and sounds across arabic persian and sanskrit cosmopolitan i will start with this excerpt from the famous badar padappattu from in the arabic malayalam from malabar in the concluding portion the author the poet laureate of arabic malayalam literature moin gutti vaidya says i an wise lacking the mastery in poetics and laws for the greatness of the subject dealing scholars my rectify rectify my flaws so i wish to i wish i invite the scholars to rectify my flaws once i complete my presentation the padapattu is a performing genre considered to be an independent category in the part 2 tradition of the pre modern malayalam literature which has identical characters with the padaipo tradition of the tamil literature the padapattus in arabi malayalam is still extant among the muslim community of malabar through their collective and individual recitations in sacred and secular gatherings the padapattus invited scant scholarly attention even though the earliest of padapattu studies could be traced from the journal the indian antiquary published in the years of 1899 and 1891 and the latest to such have been availed in malayalam and english by native malabari scholars from 16th century onwards malabar witnessed an array of unprecedented historical changes ruptures and discontinuities employment of the underutilized pre modern literary evidences like the corpora of padapattus will be complementary towards exploring the early modern history of malabar other than the conventional discursive analysis the study employs new methodologies towards understanding the translocal connections of padapattus recognizing the shared aesthetic sensibilities of the text and sounds across the arabic persian and sanskrit cosmopolitan that implies the manuscript circulation of arabic historiographical sira maghadi texts the persian fictional or semi fictional qissa or dastan literatures and the sanskrit part two tradition in early modern south asia and its historical intersection in padapattu genre in malabar i theoretically discuss what is meant by the term sense and translation here along with a brief historiographical survey of the circulation of texts and sounds in the indian ocean rest of the article scrutinizes the entanglements of padapattus with arabic persian and sanskrit cosmopolitan under sub separate subtitles with an extended study of badar padapattu or ghazwatu badar al kubra i hereby i here discuss a little about the historiographical juncture of texts and sounds in the indian ocean for a long time historiographies in the indian ocean have been excelled by the studies on economic and pilgrimage movements most recently a handful of cultural and social historians have enabled a socio cultural shift in the historiography of indian ocean especially in the growing field of early modern indian ocean studies at this historiographical juncture it is sensible to go beyond the trade and pilgrimage paradigms to uncover more towards the study of networks of texts and manuscripts in which the scholarships on literary sensibilities and sonic circulations make sense the path breaking trends commenced with the ronic richies arabic cosmopolis torsten stacher's circulatory regimes of transnational tamil islamic texts and mahmud kuria's textual long durée of islamic law books have contributed new perspectives in connecting the indian ocean world through the networks of circulated books manuscripts intellectual links and aesthetic sensibilities moving a bit nuance into intellectual history of the circulation of manuscripts in the early modern indian ocean also building upon the history of sensibilities this study proposes the concept of connected literary sensibilities 
which defines the production, consumption, and making of certain sensibilities enabled by the transmission of traveling literary genres and its translation and reception in vernacular performative texts throughout the circulatory regimes. I would prefer to call this a sensuous shift in the connected histori histories of the Indian Ocean world scholarships. What I mean by the census translated? Here the, the term translation defines recreation or transcreation of a text from one language to another, from one genre to other, while maintaining its intention, that is semantic, tone, sonic, and context, that pragmatic using genre-specific scriptorial techniques. In her pathbreaking work on South Asian literary networks, Islam translated, Ronit Ritchie has argued that translation is a history of textual affinities or a culture specific practice of conveying a text of one language in another and striving for an equivalence of meaning. Taking cue from Clarissa Vierke, I contend against per using of translation as a mere cultural appropriation in which the text one translated is primarily made to feed local discourses of identity or belonging. She put forward two reasons for the argument. Firstly, the aforesaid scrutiny does not represent the author's effort to imitate or mimesis the source text. And secondly, it does not permit and emphasize on the genre specific methods of identifying with the source text. Vyake in a study on Sogili Tendi poems, that is the Sogili course, the Tendi poems are the counterpart of Padapatus in Malabar, consciously use the term mimesis as it implies for its sensual experience of the source or original text he employed, and its resonation in the poet's imagination through which he becomes a mediator in translating the felt sensibilities into the vernacular genres, rather than a mechanical form of repetition or imitation. Madeleine Campbell and Ricardo Vidal states that in intersemiotic translations, instead of focusing on the word to word translation of the meaning, the translator effectively plays the role of the mediator in an experience, experiential process that allows the recipients, viewer, the listener, reader, or participant to recreate the sense of the source artifacts for themselves. Again, Ronit Ricci, in her recent article, Sound Across Languages, reminds that the fields of translation and philology has not yet received the introduced from sound studies as it deserves. And she foregrounds that sound is a key aspect in considering the history of translation in its diverse forms. Coming to Padapatus, the Padapatu texts were not meant for silent reading, but for a loud reading, maybe individually or collectively in the performance traditions like Padi Parayal, that is singing and narration, and Sira Parayanam, that is a Sira recital, which were very prominent among the Muslims of Malabar. So these performance traditions convinced and conveyed the audience well, what emotions, sense, and messages the authors of Padapatus wanted to be communicated or transduced to their receptors. I hereby playing a padapata, which is just audio only, and which is uh, begin by singing and after followed by a narration or explanation of the story. <laughs> This is the narration part. Due to the limitation of the time, I am going to my rest of the presentation. So, how the Arabic cosmopolis and the Padapatus are related? Inspired from Richard Eaton's recent discussion on the various forms of negotiations happened between Persian and Sanskrit cosmopolites and his findings regarding the penetration of aesthetic and literary sensibilities from one cosmopolis to another, this study looks into the conjunction of Arabic 
Persian and Sanskrit cosmopolis at the early modern Malabar in the Indian Ocean. The Arabic cosmopolis, obviously, how it was related, the Sira Mahadi text, which was traveling around the Indian Ocean, how it was influenced in the Padapatus. The Padapatu poets relied majorly on the Arabic historiographical Sira Maghazi text while composing. Moreover, they were translating the Arabic text through their own genre specific means. The Sira and Maghazi texts basically deal with the life stories of the Prophet Muhammad. The word Maghazi generally gives the meaning raiding expeditions, and from a literary perspective, it is specifically used to constitute the accounts of early Muslim military confrontations in which the Prophet Muhammad has partook actively. According to Rudy Parrott, he is a Maghazi scholar at Sahili Coast. The origin of Maghazi were presumably dated back to the 14th century or around, and he interestingly pondered its afterward circulation to all over the Arab area of influence, including Turkey, Al Andalus, Indonesia, eastern and western part of the Africa. Similarly, much later, Taika Shoaib Alim is a living Sufi scholar and scholar in Arabic, Tamil, and Persian uh, in Tamil coast, the Coromandel coast, and the Sarandi, the Sri Lanka. In his doctoral dissertation, has devoted a short chapter to discuss the influence of Maghazis and its translations into different genres in Arabi or Arab Tamil with an extended survey of Padepors. This is my uh, here, the primary source or the uh, the, the source I'm focusing on the Badr Padapat or Ghazbat Badr Al Kubra, which is written in Arabi Malayalam. It's a unique scriptorial technique. The Malabari scholars used to write Malayalam in Arabic script. The Badr Padapat or Ghazbat Badr Al Kubra, composed by the great Mapula poet laureate Moin Kutti Vaidyar in 1876, proposes an extraordinary place among the Malabari Muslims for its ceremonial, performative, and sensor importance in their everyday life. The poem describes the battle of Badr, 14 AD 624, between Muslims of Medina and disbelievers of Makkah. Detailing incidents led to the battle, the combative war front, and aftermath within 106 ishels. Ishels are the metric or melodic conventions in the Arabi Malayalam verse literature. Like other padapatus of the time, Badr Padapatu was not a mere imitation or literatim translation of its Arabic source. Rather, it enabled a creative, sensuous translation of its counterpart in Arabic into Arabic Malayalam. The title Ghazwat Badr al Kubra itself is a mimesis of the chapter titled in the Sira Maghazi text. Badr Padapatu has meta textual references to the Arabic Sira Maghazi text employed as sources, such as Sirat Rasulullah of Ibn Isha. Sirat Nabawiya of Ibn Hisham, Al Mawahib al Laduniya of Al Qasalani, and Sirat al Halabiya of Al Halabi. If we juxtapose Badr with, an, with the corresponding Arabic text, notwithstanding the local aesthetic adaptations, it is obvious to find the Padapa to follow the Arabic, Arabic original text intimately in terms of plot structure and the episodic patterns or ishels adopted in the course of the poem. Similarly, Badr Padapa is replete with Arabisms. Arabic loanwords, Arabic meters, and even excerpts of Arabic poems from the Sira Maghazi text. What makes the Padapatu fundamentally different from its Arabic counterpart is that the Arabic text is a prose work interspersed with occasional verses or poems, while the Padapatus were completely versified within varying prosodic or metric models, except in the occasional incidence of prose called Bamb, which pastiches the Arabic prose conventions. Due to the time limitations, I'm uh, jumping into the discussion of uh, Sanskrit cosmopolis. How Sanskrit cosmopolis, the Patu tradition in Sanskrit cosmopolis is connected with the Padapatus. As it is marked by the Sheldon Pollock, sociocultural political formations and expansions of the Sanskrit cosmopolis in the ages between we see 900 and AD 1300 hybridized classical Sanskrit with vernacular languages almost, almost without any exception, like a pan-South Asian phenomenon over ages in its course. Historicizing the social and pragmatic context in which the pre-modern Malayalam literatures were produced and circulated, Rich Freeman surveys the presence of Patu genre or Patu Prasthanam in the early 12th to 13th century Malabar which has taken greatly from the phonologically and morphologically transformed 
Sanskrit grammars and words and has thematically drawn from Sanskrit epics and Puranas. Ophira Gamaliel posits Ramacharitam as an end of a literary era since then the Sanskritization process intensifies and changes the literary and linguistic landscapes of early modern Kerala. And she further goes into the nuances of Arabi Malayalam and its entanglements with the Sanskrit cosmopolis, bringing Mukhyudin Mala under the scrutiny. As mentioned, uh, the Malayalam Parapattu genre comes under the same part to literary genealogy, which have ensued linguistic and thematic transformations in confluence with the polyglossia soundscape of Malabar. We have the earliest known Padapattu written by an anonymous author titled Padapattu in the second half of 17th century, which deals with the 1660s Dutch conquest of Cochin and the related 17th century, which deals with the, and, uh, the sorry, uh, which related external and internal political disturbances and rivalries occurred between the native kingdoms in Malabar. Coming to the Padapattu written in Arabi Malayalam, they fundamentally employed Sanskrit phonemes and morphemes along with the Arabic and Persian. They followed the unprecedented blending of bhakti, devotion, and viram martial aesthetic emotions pioneered by the Ramacharitam and also pastiched the poetics and mimesis, the genric properties from such literary traditions in the Sanskrit cosmopolis. Taking Moinguti by this literary Everest uh, into just concert. Just a minute. Sorry to interrupt, Esan. You have five minutes to go. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. One could easily trace his deep-rooted association with Sanskrit literary traditions in forming to that. Fawcett in his article, A, Mapla, a Popular Mapla Song of 1889, establishes Vaidya's birth in a Vaidya family who traditionally practice Ayurveda medicine as profession. Keeping this in mind, Balakrishnan Vallikunna argues towards Vaidya's profound acquaintance over Sanskrit medical treatises and its reflection in its language used for the literary productions. Now I'm moving to the third, uh, the last section of the Persian Cosmopolis. The influence of Persian literature in Arabi Malayalam literary traditions were more evident by the arrival of Khaja Sheikh Muhammad Shah of Kardan at Kondoti. He was an ardent follower of Persianate Islam, born in Kardan of Bombay in a Sayyid family who had genealogical roots in Basra in the Iraq. His court at Kondoti was rich with presence of Persian literati and also had a library with huge collection of Persian texts. Kondoti Shahs patronized the circulation and reproduction of Persian literary works in Arabi Malayalam. So how the Persian, the Pisa and Dastan traditions in Persian cosmopolis are related with the Padapatus. Moinguti Vaidhir, the poet laureate of Arabic Malayalam and the author of Badr Padapata kept a warm relation with Kondoti Shah and his court, notably with his contemporaries, Istak Shah first and second. Vaidhir composed Salasil Padapata, Salikat Padapata and Badr al-Munir Husn al-Jamal based on the stories, of, story, the stories narrated for him by Putan Maliyakil Nizamuddin Mia Sahib, who was one of the prominent Persian literary figures in Kondoti Shah's court. In his manner for storytellers, Fakra Zamani suggests that Pissa Khans or Dastangos would base their course of performance on four repetitors or registers, that is the Raz warfare episodes, Buzz quarterly festivities, Kusno Ishq, Beauty and Love, and the Ayadi, that's trickery. Why the Salasil Padapata written at his age of 15 to 16 strictly follows these repertoires with a prolonged emphasis to the register of Razm or warfare which is believed to be an adoption of the text Mafati al narrated or translated for him by Nizamuddin Mia Sahib, as mentioned in the fourth Ishal of the Padapata. The importance given by Vaidya to the Razm or warfare section of the Pissa points towards the then acceptance and receptiveness of warfare literary sensibility with as respect to the socio-political atmosphere prevailed in Malabar. That is evident in the appended introductory note to the manuscript by the author or publisher, which says, this is a Pissa, namely Salasil, accounts an amazing, wondering, and fervoring entertaining story that narrate a fierce war fought with Ibn Bail and other troops. Conclusively, the production and circulation of Padapatus in Malabar, the Padaipors in Malbar, that is Coromandel coast, the Tendis in Sohili region, 
the Hikayat Prangs or Parangs in Aceh, comprehensively in the early modern Indian Ocean locales and later, which were translations from Arabic or Persian original literary works, contextualizes their writing in a historical moment of political crisis. Transition and transformation. This political crisis inflicted or complicated by the colonial interventions in the early modern Indian Ocean literals and later set off an unprecedented reception of traveling Arabic and Persian warfare literatures and its translations into vernacular genres. Without any doubt, what made them connected was the unifying ideology of Islam and unifying geography of the Indian Ocean. These connected literary activities and sensibilities through animated histories, embodying fictions and semi-fictions, engendering valor and emotions, folded different senses of temporality and justice towards new forms of literary subjectivity and positionality in the early modern Indian Ocean. Thank you so much. I think I should stop here and welcome the question and answer session. Right. Thank you, Isan. Uh, we have a lot of questions to all the speakers who have spoken here. Unfortunately, Sanjay will not be able to join us. So, Carolyn, are you still there with us? Hello, Carolyn, are you there with us? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, Carolyn, uh, uh, Professor Dilip Menon had a question uh, or a comment uh, for you. Just a moment. Um, he had written that if the idea of cosmopolitanism is not to be merely nostalgic sentimentality, there needs to be robust engagement with the sites and facets as much as historical location of cosmopolitanism in Mangalore, a contingent cosmopolitanism perhaps. Would you like to respond to that? A contingent cosmopolitan um... Maybe because of the geography that it involved and the location and the setting. And uh, yes, in, in a way, I do agree that, uh, you know, after overland transport sort of came about, Manglo did uh, lose its significance. So uh, it perhaps is a nostalgic sentimentality of the past. And uh, I, I think um, I have to, you know, um, we look at um, so many ideas when it comes to cosmopolitanism of the port of Mangalore uh, today, especially in the context um, uh, of its geography and its um, and the way it uh, works today. All right. Um, we have a comment of sorts from Professor Simi Malhotra. She's writing, was thinking exactly the same thing. At the end of three days, we have somehow come to expect cosmopolitanism to have the potential to deliver us all to the promised land, irrespective of contingencies involved, not wanting the strength, strength, strength to cosmopolitanism to get lost in some universal invoking of it. It might be instructive to look at not just the contingencies of cosmopolitanism, Cosmopolitanism, if not those of competing cosmopolitanisms, but perhaps also what and what all cosmopolitanism may end up obfuscating, eliding, etc. So this is a general comment for I think all the speakers to respond. If anybody wants to respond to that. Okay. Um, okay, we now have a question from Stephen. Uh, hello, I, I'm, am I audible to everybody? As for Sanjay, Aditi, you can leave my question and Juvi's question. They were both directed to Sanjay. Right, yeah, yeah. These questions yeah. are directed to Sanjay, right, yeah. Stephen? Uh, we have a question from Anuradha, ma'am. Uh, is this also directed to Sanjay? Uh, yes, yes, it seems like. Uh, we have another question. It seems directed to Sanjay again. Professor Dilip Menon has a question to uh, has a comment or question to Isan, and I'm reading it out. Hi, Isan. What uh, an ex uh, an exciting landscape where we needed a soundscape as well. You cite only textual scholars in your essay. Since you are dealing with what you call a sonic landscape, perhaps you need to bring in the work of ethnomusicology and performative arts like dance. This could connect up nicely with the work done by Ananya Kabir on 
um, alley gropolix and the circulation of dance forms in the oceans as much as the University of Cape Town and Ambedkar University project on Afro-Asian musical forms, we need a stronger attention uh, we need a stronger attention to the performatives in performative in your paper since you say clearly that these texts were not meant to be read out but rather performed uh, patrick uh, easenlor's book sounding islam for example which looks at what he calls the sonic atmospheres in the indian ocean would you like to respond to that isan yes uh, thank you so much uh, professor dilip melan for the question and uh, as i'm in an early stage of my research this is this is what I am looking into, but my discipline is like <laughs> Lokjan uh, in front of that. How a historian have to look uh, about a ephemeral sound in the past? So I'm basically I'm dealing with the early modern Padapatus, the early modern. So obviously we don't have any recordings or sound recordings. What you have to look at is the ethnographic archives and field works to do. So. Yeah, I'm uh, the Patrick Eisenhaus work on uh, in the Maldives about the uh, Nath, the transoceanic movements of Naths from the mainland India, the the discographies and how the uh, uh, the Nath uh, songs are transported or transmission to the Maldives and how they are making a, a sonic atmosphere there. But and seriously thinking about a sonic Indian Ocean sonic soundscape or Indian Ocean sonic atmosphere, but I need more ethnomusicological uh, investigation to that. And um, that's why I'm, I'm uh, taking the history of sensibilities with me, history of sensory history, because as history is such a, a discipline, I have some um, methodological problems before that. But even now there is emerging disciplines like history of sounds, and history of historical acoustomology, so which looks into how we can trace the sounds without the recorded voices in the uh, epigraphies and what we say the text from the images, from the sculptures, and the architectures. How we can retrieve the grains of voices from the archives without having the uh, uh, what ethnomusicology archives or music archives. So obviously, I will have to do my ethnomusicological. Um, investigations on that. That's I'm looking for a, a graduate position <laughs> anywhere around the globe for doing that all because I have just completed my MA, MA studies. So thank you so much for asking that question. Right, Isan, we have some more questions from Anuradha ma'am for you. Uh, she's writing, Isan, somewhere along you mentioned trans-oceanic translation. Could you please elaborate? Also, she has more questions. She is writing, why do you choose to see Arabic, Persian, and Sanskrit cosmopolis in relation to Parapattus? Uh, did they not find articulation in the local languages? Yes, obviously, it, it is in Arabic Malayalam. And I, I was looking how this uh, traveling Sira Magazi text in Arabic cosmopolis in around the Indian Ocean, it have reception in Aceh in the name of Hikayat Parangs, the Padapatu counterpart, and in Koramandal coast we have Padaypos, and in Sohili coast we have Utendis or Tendis, and serious researches are going on that. So how these traveling Sira Magazi texts and the Kisan Dastan text in Persian was translated or transported through, or uh, how it make a transoceanic possibility of translation, and it was census, uh, basically it was census translated, not the text exactly. They were, the poets were just reimagining that text or reading that text and they, they were reimagining it in the vernacular soundscape. Like I have uh, uh, slides on that, like when Moin Kutivaidar in Padar Padapatu, he talk about the Arabians, the uh, Arab community or the Arab troop coming to the war front um, using their own musical instruments and their own sounds. But why they're moving to why they're it, it translate in the vernacular Arabic Malayalam or Malayalam soundscape using the Maddala, Murish, uh, such music, the Kerala music instruments the, or the South Indian music instruments. He was just translate. So there is vernacular element. Uh, so basically, I'm saying by this uh, paper, I want to propose that uh, the coexistence of vernacular and cosmopolitan. And that is evident from the Malabar Coast. 
Okay, all right. Uh, there is a comment from Professor Dilip Menon. He is writing a lot of these parapatus continue to be performed now, so reconstruction of sound should be possible. Yes, yes. It's it's still extant. Basically, I'm a performer. I could perform the parapatus or the limitations. Uh, we will uh, conduct it in another session. All right. So. Uh, Sanjay has attempted to answer Stephen's question. He sent it via text to him, and that is up on the chat box for everybody to read. Um, meanwhile, I don't seem to have any other questions or comments here. If I have missed anything, uh, maybe uh, somebody can notify, or else we can perhaps end the discussion. I'll hand over back to Anuradha, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Aditi. I mean, this has been a most stimulating session despite all the technical glitches that we've been having. So starting from the old port of Mangal and the uh, cosmopolitan culture there and the heterogeneous diversity of the city port and its present uh, rendering to Sanjay Dansalia's paper of lyrics as travelogue beyond boundaries, where he tried to bring in different kind of mystical traditions and tried to see it as a universal, uh, tried to kind of delineate a universalizing potential in them, which would promote a new uh, collectivism, if I have understood him collect correctly. And then, of course, the last paper on the Padapattus in the Indian Ocean by Esanul Ittasam. Uh, they were really wonderful deliberations in three different kind of uh, domains, though the last two papers dealt with uh, uh, music one way or the other. So it has been a kind of a, a very uh, rich uh, experience listening to these three scholars. And uh, thank you very much, all of you. And thank you for, to the part, uh, for all the questions and comments which were there on the chat box and uh, Sanjay has been able to answer some and maybe during the course of the uh, proceedings later, we can perhaps have more responses from his side. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank, uh, thank you everyone for joining this session. Uh, Ma'am, uh, Sanjay wanted to say thanks to the chair for her comments and uh, in general also to the organizers. And thank you everyone for joining this session. Our next session will be in one and a half hours. It will be at 6.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time and 8 a.m. at Indian Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for joining.